Let me just start by saying thank you, Ben. Really appreciate having you here today, uh, and thank you for agreeing to have this discussion with with me about about the arts and and Corona. Uh, um, just just for you know, lots of people might not know you uh, that might watch this. Tell us a little bit about you know your role in your organization and and your journey there. Got it. Um, uh, and thanks for having me for this. I'm sorry this is the occasion to reconnect us. Uh, after having had a great time with you about a year, close to a year ago by now, I guess, uh, with the annual season launch at the R Center last fall. Uh, uh, I'm the president of the Jerome Foundation in St. Paul, Minnesota. The Jerome Foundation was founded by composer, filmmaker, uh, painter, photographer, actor, uh, Jerome Hill, who was born to a wealthy family in St. Paul, Minnesota, and spent much of his creative life in New York City. Uh, as a filmmaker and ultimately won an Academy Award for Best Director at one point in time, uh, paying, paying honor to his legacy. We support emerging artists in the state of Minnesota in honor of where he was born, uh, and in New York City, which is in honor of where he spent his creative years. And we support artists in all disciplines in those places. Uh, before I came to Jerome, I've had a varied career. I started out after those odd jobs that I had, like selling lawnmowers and being a dishwasher and a Christian camp counselor. And I have a whole resume that way, which I don't think you're interested in. Uh, but I, I was a high school English teacher. Um, I was an actor. I was a college professor. Uh, I was a theater director. I was the CEO of a national service organization for the theater discipline. But much of my career has been spent in organized philanthropy, uh, in government philanthropy during my stint at the National Endowment for the Arts, in corporate philanthropy, during my stint at what was then the Dayton Hudson Corporation and is now the Target Stores Corporation, and in private philanthropy, both at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and now at Jerome. And as disparate as all of those things are, I like to think that the things that bind my various experiences together are a centrality to the arts at the very center of what I did, and the opportunity, whether as a teacher or as a director or as a philanthropist, to really help pull together groups of people and to galvanize through resources, whether those are financial or human or intellectual, to really galvanize and help move talent forward. And that's been the great blessing and opportunity that I've been given in my life. You know, Ben, I always uh, enjoy and I'm inspired by your passion for the arts. It seems <laughs> like you can, you can do any job on this planet and you'll find a way to get the arts to be celebrated and, and yeah. lift through it. It's in your blood. Thank you. uh, you know, the work you do at, at Jerome obviously must have been impacted by Corona and, and those that you work with through Jerome. Can you describe that impact? Yeah, um, uh, it's, you know, on a purely mechanical level in terms of what it's impacted us to do. You know, we're, we all opted to work from home starting on March 10th. We begin our day every day with Zoom meetings with the full staff. We're depending far much more on uh, video conferencing, of course, and working from the privacy of our own homes. And I spend a lot more time now with spreadsheets, trying to forecast multiple scenarios about what our giving budget is going to look like in the next period, which is, as many of us know, a period that we can't predict. So depending on both the severity of the economic change and the duration of both the economic turn and the uh, uh, the, and the virus in this case, we could be back up and running sort of in full strength within a year or so, you know, with very nominal impact on our giving budgets and other scenarios I've run, we won't be returned to our current level of giving until 2034. So a lot of what we do is just try to understand both for the short term and the long term what we're doing. A, a lot of what this called on us to do was to think first of all about what our capacity was to respond in the short term. Uh, we did some very easy things like many people did. We signaled to all of our grantees, don't worry about reporting requirements, don't worry about administrative hoops that we typically put you through. We should be your last priority in that regard, so when you are ready to report to us, do so, but take that off your urgency calendar. We said to all of the organizations we funded, we, and we do multi-year grants, We've said the, 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 year of, the year you're entering of your grant period, you should just feel the freedom to transform entirely general operating support and to remove any project restrictions we had on that. For the artists, we fund directly out of our office, not 
through the re-granting programs we do, which are multiple. We said to all of those artists, here's $2,000 if you need it for emergency personal relief. And if you don't need it, then don't ask for it, but we have it available to you if you want it. Uh, and almost every artist has said, I need that funding. So we've shipped money out to them out the door. We've joined four uh, consortium efforts where multiple funders are coming together to centralize resources for artists and arts organizations, both regionally and nationally. Uh, but we also made the conscious decision to say, and that's as far as we want to go for now, because when we really reflected on what did we learn from 9-11, what did we learn from the economic down, downturn of 2008, one of the things we believed was in the flush of the emergency, there were many donors who dug deep, especially board members who said, I feel your pain, let me go an extra mile in giving to you. Uh, but a year later, very few of those donations were sustained. A lot of people said, you know, I, I helped you last year. Why isn't it fixed? Even though the crises had been far from repaired. Mm -hmm. And we recognized that if we exploit our full potential to respond now, we aren't going to be able to do anything a year from now when the unforeseen impacts come home to roost. And so we deliberately have said, let's calibrate our response so that we can be there to respond to things we can't yet foresee about which we can't know in a time when we're worried that other donors will have walked away. Yeah. So we, we've reaffirmed our values and what we stand for. We've reaffirmed the people that we have funded. We've reaffirmed our presence by going beyond those we fund through the, through the consortium efforts, but we've also reaffirmed our long-term uh, desire to be here and, we're, and to play the long game, not to play the short game. Well, uh, you know, I'm sure I speak on behalf of uh, the artists that you, that you work with, but just the, the field in general, thank you for your thoughtful leadership. Um, sure. This is a time when that kind of leadership is needed, and I, I, I'm sure it's a, an example that's inspiring many. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And to, sure. um, and to your point of, of uh, you know, thinking about the tail of this, I think, uh, you know, we talk amongst our team as well, it's one challenge to get through the lockdown. Oh. The recovery might be a bigger challenge. And so yeah. to keep some reserves for that moment uh, is thoughtful. So I, I like hearing that. Appreciate hearing that from you. Sure. Well, um, I mean, it, 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 as you know, I, and, and for, I mean, frankly, uh, this will probably be of no interest to anyone other than people in foundations. Uh, foundations like ours average our budgets over three years. I average our assets over three years to determine the basis of what we will give away. Mm. And the fact that we're coming off very, three very strong years up until February and March, and that we draw the line in the sand because of our fiscal calendar in, in, in January, we're actually going to see our budget grow next year. It's the three years after that that we anticipate our budget falling. And we're going to have a very serious discussion a year from now about, even though our budget's falling, should we invest, should we distribute more than 5% of our assets, which is the legal requirement we have to do every year? Should we give away six or seven or 8% or should we even think about spending out depending on the depths of the crisis? That, that's just a conversation that because we're going into a bigger budget next year, we decided yeah. deliberately to defer to a year from now. So, Ben, we're in this extraordinary moment of, um, being forced to be almost inhuman by not, you know, by not being in touch with each other, by not not being able to assemble, um, and so I ju I just wonder what role do you think the arts can and should play during this extraordinary moment right now? Well, you know, part of what I've always thought about the arts, and I think you've heard me say this, is is that as a community, there are so many different roles we play. You know, there are some arts organizations who primarily deal in classic or established work and who remind us every time we come together about what it means to reach across time and history to find the sort of common threads that unite us to our ancestors. There are other organizations whose role is to assemble the community in the here and now and to talk about how is it that we begin to give voice to communities who haven't had that opportunity before. There are other arts organizations that pull together people to say, how do we help foster your ability to make your own artwork? And so 
the idea about talking about our role for me, I just would say basically, I would pluralize that to say our roles rather than our role. And I think they will continue to be as, as many and as varied, and this is part of our strength as a community, as they have been in the past. You know, for performing arts organizations, I've always thought, you know, especially in this time, there are three kinds of, there's, there's a choice you make implicitly or explicitly about what's the impact of your work going to be in your community? What, what, what are you trying to achieve by asking people to come together? You know, more than just seeing Alvin Ailey or seeing the Miami Symphony or seeing the small theater down the street or whatever. And, and I think, you know, there are some arts organizations who exist in a great way to call out injustice and to call out inequities and to really mobilize and energize our civic and political passions. Mm. I think there are other groups who say, I, I don't want to call out, I want to call in, I want to see if we can find a way to have a different kind of conversation across, uh, across division. And there are still other groups who say, I, I just want to call us together because especially in this time, just to be in the same space and realize that people that we may not think we share a lot with, that we actually laugh at the same things and cheer at the same things and cry at the same things, I, I think there's a role we play in binding a social fabric together that's really critical, whatever our ultimate objectives may be. You know, in, in this moment, I coincidentally, I had just not terribly long ago, binge watched Orange is the New Black because friends of mine have. It. And if you've watched that series, you know that there's, uh, uh, when you misbehave, you're sent to solitary confinement, which is called the shoe. And right lately, this pandemic has felt to me like, okay, we've all been sent to the shoe. We're all in the shoe right now. And one of the things you appreciate in that series is when confined to the shoe, people learn creatively how to communicate with each other. They learn to tap on the pipes to tap out Morse codes. They learn to tie strings on the back of cockroaches that run across the hall. So they've got ways to pass notes back and forth. They learn to be, I mean, there are all sorts of ways that people learn to transcend the limitations of the shoe to continue to communicate and interact as human beings. And right now I think we're seeing just the beginning of a door cracking open as people who historically have been committed to the tyranny of the live space, beginning to ask themselves, how is it we find in our most creative ways the ability to keep human communication together even when we can't be in the same space breathing the same air? So I think there, there's a, a, a moment right now where in a kind of crucible refining moment, at its best, I, I think we're all looking for silver linings in this, we are being asked individually to say, what is the value we have to our community? What is it? We, what is the impact we want our work to have? And what are the many ways we might pursue that, of which the live performance will always be a way, but may now not be the only way? Mm. Um, and my hope is, of course, that on the far side of this, we're not going to say, oh, okay, well, that's over. Now we can go back to what we were doing. You may or may not have seen today's Wall Street Journal. There's a front page article saying business as normal will be anything but. And right now it's all about people in, in, certain, in amusement parks are going to be wearing masks and being given temperature checks at the door before they're allowed on the site. Restaurants are going to cut back to half or quarter capacity and do staggered seating. They're going to put up plastic shields and wood panels between tables. I mean, it, it's going to be a transformed environment. and. I don't know how the I don't know how you respond to that in terms of the work you do at the Art Center. Are you guys going to stagger seating? Are you going to take out two thirds of your seats so that people can sit far apart? Is what's that going to do to your union contract, which is predicated on your capacity? And I mean, it, it's just a big. I don't know. No, we're certainly grappling with a, a lot of unknowns, uh, and and the one unknown that I that I wonder about, that I, I just wonder what you thought about this, and I, I don't want to sound too self-serving, but we love it when our audiences and our community come into our theaters. That's what we love. That's yeah. what we do, and our mission is about connecting people. 
and connect, connecting community to each other, to us, to the arts. Um, but right now, people have gone through and are going through terrible things. They are losing their jobs. They're losing more. Some of them, uh, how can I possibly ask them that the art should be on their radar now, right now? What, 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 do I, what do I say to them when they have so many other things to think about right now? Well, uh, depending, of course, on who you're talking to. And, of course, as you know, these kind of conversations really are, uh, reflect who what the person you're talking to cares about. I mean, the, the, the two things I, that I firmly believe in this moment, one is I do think it's important to reaffirm in this moment when people are saying, yeah, the people are losing their jobs. How can I care about the arts? Is to say, well, you know, quite frankly, artists are people too. And artists and arts administrators and arts technicians are a very big part of that community who is losing their work. You know, artists are losing the opportunities to perform shows they have built and for which they've expended enormous amounts of cash already and for whom they've paid people to rehearse are now not going to happen. Commissions and future productions have dried up for them. And for many artists, as we know, many artists, as we know, you, you sustain yourself through waiting tables or bartending or teaching in the public school system or in the hospitality industry and those jobs are gone and with those jobs go your health care benefits and your benefits and the other things that are going to pay your rent and so I, I, I tend to resist a, a, a distinction from people who say yeah but people are losing their jobs yeah a big chunk of those people are artists and technicians and managers and it's not only the people who work in organized uh, uh, places like yours it's people who we take for granted who tour those street fairs to sell their ceramics it's the people and we're a big part of that population so a how is it that we consciously in in every capacity as we structure government relief as we structure relief efforts make sure that we're structuring them in a way that the arts are embraced in the constituencies to be affected and not inadvertently excluded. That, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing, though, I'd say is I, I do think this is also a moment where people, consciously or unconsciously, massively reaffirming that the arts are critical to how you get through these moments. I mean, you, you go online and the amount of people who are streaming work, the online book clubs that are participating, the way people are posting pictures they've done or pictures their children have done. I mean, this is a moment that's proving in a moment of critical spiritual and physical decimation. It's the arts that often give people the opportunity to express their pain or to express their joy. It's the arts that allow people to come together and have a common platform to discuss. I mean, the arts, right now i think are at a vibrant moment it's just that delivery system is not the one we've historically prioritized and with that for me again there, there there's an opportunity i i don't know you know coming on the other side how much we will come together i don't know how much you know there's a term called social scarring about people being afraid to come together i don't know if people are going to be socially scarred i I remember after nine. Uh, I remember after nine eleven in New York, where I was living at the time, people were desperate to be back in the same space after being told they couldn't be. You know, there was a period that a lot of people forget that after nine eleven, you could not go below Fourteenth Street. It was sealed off, and a lot of theaters down there had to go dark. And they almost all reported that when they reopened, they were overwhelmed with people just desperate to be in the same space. Will that happen this time? I, I don't know. Will How quickly can we respond when the all clear light's on? I, I don't know. The longer this goes on, the longer that on-ramp's going to be again, probably. If we get to a point where we just can't stay apart anymore and we get to the breaking point, if we have to every day ride the subways with masks on and go everywhere with masks on, will we feel comfortable sitting next to somebody in an auditorium while we have a mask on? I, I don't know. I don't think any of us can know this at this point in time. Uh, but I do think that there's a question to be asked about how do we think about 
what we are learning about the multiple ways in which we reach a community of which the live performance is a way mm-hmm. but may not be the only way. Uh, I, so I, my, my hope is, of course, that this is a moment of expanding how we operate, even while it's a moment that's asking us very deeply to be crystal clear about what we're trying to achieve. Um, just picking up on something you said about mm-hmm people's needs right now. I think we all would agree this is a tough moment, but it would be completely desperate without music or without the ability to access. I mean, everybody at home is using the arts right now to make their day tolerable, to to get through the day, to give them some sense of joy or uh, et cetera. But, but so, so go with me to the other side of this, go with me to the moment when, the light gets switched on and, and we can return. And yes, it will be a, a slow fade, um, but it will come on again. Um, do you think there's a very specific role the arts and artists can and should be thinking about playing during that time? Well, I mean, I think, as you know, that, that uh, there are a number of extrinsic uh, roles that the arts play that are critical to community health beyond whatever we offer on stages. You know, one of the things we've always taken great pride in as an arts community, especially in government circles, is the role we play as economic engines for the communities. The way that uh, uh, restaurant uh, uh, patronage is often, especially in a neighborhood, a clearly corollarily linked to whether there's something on stage or not. We know that people spend money on parking. We know that in a place like Miami, the arts are a big draw for tourism. We know that so when, when the arts are on and when the, um, uh, 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 why am I blanking on the name of the big arts uh, um, event every year in Miami, the big visual arts event? Art Basel. Yeah, Art, Art Basel. Art Basel draws tens of thousands of people from all over the world to cram into hotels and restaurants and more. So on some level, the arts are an important engine to help return a community to greater economic vibrancy when pop- properly seen. And so whatever we are offering on the stages or not, that, that is not to be dismissed. And we are clearly in ways we often don't claim credit for, Yes, we're employing artists, but we're also directly employing construction workers and caterers and uh, uh, and taxi drivers and, you know, all sorts of other people's own personal business has a direct link to our health in a way that, that we will help stimulate greater economic self-sufficiency for them. Um, I do think on the far side, again, the arts are going to have an opportunity. It's It's going to be a real critical moment. I don't know, I can't predict, and and you're probably smarter about this than I am, whether people's increasing comfort with remote uh, learning will actually make them more dependent on remote for arts experience and less for the live. I, I don't know. You know, people are going to say, God, look at everything Netflix doing. Look at every, why do I need to go downtown? I can get all this at home. Maybe, maybe not. I, it, it's a hard thing to predict. Uh, um, I, I do think the three things that are really interesting to me right now is arts organizations who are asking not only how do we survive the moment, but in a longer term, what do we want to look like at the far side of this? You know, what, what is it we're trying to achieve at the far end? So it's not just how do we get back to what we were doing? Mm-hmm. This is an opportunity to really say, what is it we, you know, we, we've often spent a lot of time saying, God, you know, we're, we, there are a lot of things we don't like about uh, our current structures and our current capacities. This may be a moment to rethink that and to try to be mo- move into a larger thing. I, I do think secondarily, and I, I hate to say this, I don't think this is a one-off. Um, and, and again, part of what we can't know at this point in time that has so much impact on how we're going to recover is, will there be a vaccine? Will there not be a vaccine? If there's not a vaccine, it, what happens if this re-spikes in the winter? You know, is that, how's that, what's it going to mean economically about people's confidence to come back together? What is it going to mean for your donor pool if a lot of your donors, frankly, are in the most vulnerable populations? 
But whether it's this virus or it's a different virus, because we've seen in recent times and have been lucky to avoid the bird flu and Ebola and all sorts of other, there are other things that are coming down the pike. There are things like 9-11. There are people that have said disruption is going to be a new normal, I think is probably really true. And whether it's this virus, the real question I think our organizations are asking in a smart way is, an artist, how do I think about what it means to be resilient in recognition that it may not be this again, but something else is going to throw us? I mean, in, in your place, hurricanes, weather change, climate. But how do you, how do you think about the capacity for ongoing resilience? Uh, and then the third thing I think is, is this is a moment that really asks us all to deeply reaffirm what we stand for and why. I, I, I think, you know, I, uh, I, I've been asked to teach a lot of online classes lately, I think primarily because people my age don't know how to teach online. And so they think, who can talk for two hours and that gets another class I can check off my list, you know, so I'm getting asked to do this a lot. And I've seen a lot of pain in student faces and a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of anger. Uh, uh, especially among people who are in their senior year who feel like they've been deprived of graduation and who have been dispersed without being able to say goodbye to classmates. Um, and a sense of this has never happened before to us in human history. And there's part of me that, because I'm as old as I am, that, that has said to them, as weird as this is, this doesn't feel unfamiliar to me because I'm old enough to remember polio when we couldn't swim in the pools and we couldn't play with the kids down the street because we didn't know how that was spread. I remember the very early days of the AIDS virus where we didn't know what it was and we didn't know whether you could hold somebody's hand or not and we didn't know um, uh, who, who of our friends that appeared healthy was or was not. I remember, of course, 9-11. I remember 2008. And, so in a lot of that, I have the confidence that we will get through this and we will get through it. And if we get through it correctly, we'll get through it carrying forward the lessons of what we have known and what we've experienced rather than discard them. And things may not be the same, but we will have an opportunity to earn our value in a new way in our communities. Um, and so in that way, I, I, I think that, that the role the arts will play going forward on the far side will really reflect a difference. It, it, I think it's very clear already. I'm, I'm sorry I'm thinking out loud on this. I, I think there's, there has been a real clarity in the divisions between in an, a crisis arts organizations whose first response is, oh my God, what's the community going to do for me? Versus arts organizations who say, oh my God, in a time of such pain and crisis, what is it my community needs that I can help provide them? Mm -hmm. And I think that, art, that artists and organizations who have been thinking more about how they fill a human need are going to be those on the front lines ready to seize a value going forward that they can play with their communities because they're already there. Um, I'm being a little incoherent uh, and I apologize for this. Really? I, I do think that we will, maybe not in the same scale and in the same way, be calling people together again to have a common experience. I think we will be calling people together to be generous in the way that they listen to each other. I think hopefully we'll be calling people together unafraid to ask them to behave in new ways. Um, I hope we will be calling people together to celebrate one another's generosity to one another. I, I, I'm deeply moved by the common celebrations every night with people banging drums at seven o'clock every night to salute the frontline responders and to really salute other people and recognize the generosity of others. I think there's just a wonderful uniqueness that the performing arts at least play in bringing us together to, to breathe the same air, you know, as, as, uh, 
Um, Zelda Fitch Chandler, a famous theater director, always used to say, you know, theater is a form of conspiracy and to conspire means that we breathe the same air. There's a unique reaffirming human, humane experience in doing that. And I think we will be there to provide it. How we do it, on what scale we do it, to whom we do it, for whom we do it, that's all the work of the of moving forward to figure out how we can offer those things. I think about the future as uh, business as usual, but very different. <laughs> you, know, you know, we're going to do what we do, but it's going to be done in very, very different ways. And uh, that's kind of ex exciting and, and scary at the same time. And I think that's what the future looks like. I, I just want to ask you. Um, can I just say one thing to that? You know, yeah. and, and, I'm, and I'm glad we're, you're, you can add it uh, uh, because this may or may not be useful. You know, I, I, I've thought a lot. Of, there was a children's theater I dealt with a decade ago who I remember at the time that I visited them and other people. I, I was working with a lot of theaters and I, people would talk about their mission. And they would say, our mission is to produce great plays. Our mission is to do world-class theater. Our mission is blah, blah, blah. And this one children's theater said, our mission is to bring joy into children's lives. Yeah. And I thought... In this crisis, you are already aware that one way you do that is by mounting a play, but there are thousands of ways that you can, through video conferencing and remote, and also bring joy into children's lives, and the world can really be your oyster. If, if we can be that cognizant of what our role is, I think the business as usual might be a rebalancing of what we had done with the yeah. new ways we can fulfill that ultimate human need. Yeah, we went through a strategic exercise and it was really refreshing to see how everybody we spoke to led us to a point where our, our mission is very simply to connect people. Yeah. And, uh, and it's about people and it's about relationships. And we've decided that we're in the relationship business and uh, rather than the arts business, it, it's, uh, it's, it's the medium, but uh, the message in the end is more about human beings connecting. Yeah. Um, so when I talk, you talked a lot about your foundation and the role it decided to play during this time. Um, many of our donors and sponsors, you mentioned them earlier, and other philanthropists and generous people who, who help the arts uh, survive financially or grow financially are in tough places right now. Um, how do I talk to them about our need right now during their time of, of struggle? Well, uh, I mean, again, part of this is about speaking to where your audience is listening from. Uh, um, there are donors, presumably, whose major passion is the future generation and kids and what kid, the world in which kids are going to grow into. And I think partly one of the things that those donors need to be reminded of is the impact of the arts on kids. We, we know that uh, kids who have arts experiences and have arts programs at the schools do 90 points higher in their SATs. We know their disciplinary infractions drop. We know they become exponentially more likely to graduate from high school. And that high school graduation is one of the single biggest indicators of, uh, or failure to graduate from high school is one of the single biggest indicators of probability of being incarcerated in a federal jail. I mean, there's a lot we can offer if what you care about is the health of kids and the intellectual and spiritual development of the kids, we have a lot we can say to you. Mm. That's not the same thing as when you talk to the Chamber of Commerce who cares about the return of business. And that's when I think we talk about the things we've already talked about, about economic leverage and impact, et cetera. I, I do think right now there is, in my experience at least, one of the things I think people are deeply concerned about in our country is the the rancorous political polarization that we're all experiencing right now. Um, I think people are increasingly finding it difficult to spend time or talk to people other than the one who they perceive they have difference with. And recently a, a, a poll really that I saw out of Georgetown said that it's this polarization that's the most common concern Americans have today. I do think, as I said earlier, that the arts have the opportunity to bind a social fabric together because ultimately what we're asking people to do is to come together 
with people who aren't like each other when we do our work at our very best, to be generous and considerate and to listen to one another, to listen in ways that go beyond sound bites and go beyond oversimplification, but to listen to or experience nuanced, substantive, more complex experiences, and to do it in the spirit not of competition but cooperation, all of which flies in the faces of other things. Uh, so I, I do think that there's an opportunity to think about what is the role that the arts play in binding our social fabric together. It's become increasingly frayed. As we know, the internet, for all of its great, wonderful powers, incorporates or encourages a kind of echo chamber that can drive people further apart. It gives permission to be people to be their worst selves, not their best selves. How is it that coming back together reinvigorates a civic dialogue and a civic quality that we're going to need if we get through these times? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think people who may not perceive they care about the arts because they think about it as a dispensable thrill on reflection, if we can frame it in terms of how it is an alternative to the increasing polarization of our, of our communities may find it possible to respond. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, yeah. I want to ask you because you are such a huge encourager and a flag waver and a cheerleader for the arts, say something to artists right now, you know, where they are, you know, what they're going through, you know, how crucial they are uh, in our lives. Uh, what would you say to them right now? Um, in addition to what I've already said about th this too will pass, uh, which I, I genuinely believe, um, I, I, I guess probably I'd say three things. One is first and foremost, um, th thank you for the work you have done and the work you're doing. Um, uh, the, the artists that I see right now are frustrated and and in pain and in fear but they are doing work god bless them they are doing work and they are being creative about how they how they distribute their work but they're also taking this moment to think genuinely and generously about how is it i can encourage my colleagues how can i share resources with other people how can i reach out to my communities and in, in that are in pain how can i how can i keep this and us and my own creative energies moving forward and the work they're coming up with is at its best I think deeply inspiring and creative and vibrant and robust even while I'm sure it is not it, it's only a fraction of what the artist envisioned the work could be but but for their perseverance and their stubbornness and their creativity I, I would say thank you, first of all. Uh, the second thing I would say is realistically uh, moving forward, I think we're going to be entering conversations about, at least in a short term, about how we think about sharing more limited resources. You know, there's a, there's a story that, that I used to tell in, in, in 2008, but Somebody reminded me of, and I thought, yeah, that, that, that's come up again. There's a, there's a woman here in Minnesota named Ann Bancroft, uh, not the actor, but who was the first woman to cross both the North and the South Poles. And she did expeditions of the Iditarod, and you know, she's a polar explorer, often with dog teams. And if you do those races, it's not just you and the dogs. You, you have assistants and people that cook and medical people, and so there are entire teams of people that go. And when you also do those races, because of the need for speed and because of, 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 of who you're taking, et cetera, it's calibrated within a gram of how much does everybody weigh together and how much can the dogs pull and how quickly, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so it's, it's, it's a very, it, it, it is on the knife capitalization in lack of a better term. And Anne tells a story about being on one of those expeditions and being in a race and one or possibly two of the dogs died along the way. And there were anguishing meetings, anguished meetings 
uh, of, uh, around the fire or whatever it was that night about with the dogs, with, with having lost two dogs, not everybody can finish the race. You know, we're going to have to leave people behind. We're going to have to call for help and say, you've got to come air back these people out of here. And then she said, and then somebody realized if we are willing to sleep three people in a single sleeping bag and leave the other equipment and the other food for the dogs, we can all finish the race. And in this moment going forward, there's going to be a period where if we're willing to think unconventionally, we're going to need to sleep three to a bag. But if we are willing to do this, I think we can all get through it. But it is going to mean some discomfort and some generosity and some, some levels of, 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 of personal interaction that, that, that we're not necessarily historically comfortable with or that we've done. But I think if we are willing to sleep three to a bag, we're, we're all going to get through this. Uh, I, I would also say to them, uh, and finally, um, my own conviction is we need you not only in the present, we need you for the future possibly more than we ever have. Um, I, I do believe we are in a deeply spiritually dysfunctional moment in this country where we have lost and are rapidly losing the ability to hear one another generously and to share a common space with people with whom we disagree. And if we don't recapture that ability, we, I, I don't think we have a future in this country. Uh, and the arts for me are a critical, critical piece of reinvigorating that ability to commune in all of the richest senses and to be and share and disclose together. And we need it and the work of the artist to get us there more than we have in human history. So again, with my thanks for fighting the good battle, I would reinforce my conviction <clears throat> that, the, that difficult days lie ahead, but it's important that we all get through. Well, Ben, as always, uh, inspiring uh, to listen to you and your passion is uh, contagious. Thank you. Thank you for uh, infecting us with a passion rather than with the virus. It's uh, oh. really amazing. Thank you. Well, you, you guys are the ones who do the, the work. I mean, I have to say it was such a joy to be in Miami and to see you pull together the arts community for that season launch and to see the level of vibrancy and generosity and the myriad communities that were uh, uh, impacted by the work, to see the overflow of audiences just hungry to connect with the arts organizations down there and to see the vibrancy of the Miami community was, a, was an honor and a treat. And so my hat's off to you, both at the Arts Center, but as the entire Miami arts community. So thanks for giving me time. We uh, are all privileged to be to have the best job in the world, right? Um, our, we do. We do. We do. Well, Ben, listen, thank you again for doing this. I appreciate your generosity to share. Uh, and we will, we, we're going to get through this. There's no doubt about it. And I can't wait for us to, uh, to breathe together again. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.